old friend, and welcome to Olympia, home of the Olympic Games. We're standing in the main section of Olympia, where the Olympic Games themselves took place. Over the course of the festival, athletes competed against each other for prestige and glory to honor themselves and their cities. Enjoy your visit, friend. I'll check in when you're done to make sure you've been paying attention. The first day of the Olympic Festival began with a swearing-in ceremony for the participating athletes, trainers, and judges. The ceremony took place in front of the altar of Zeus Horkios, or Zeus of the Oath. Athletes would swear that they would follow the Olympic rules while judges promised to be fair and unbiased. Then the competitions began, starting with a contest between heralds and trumpeters over who would have the privilege of announcing the games. The first day's athletic competitions consisted of wrestling, running, and boxing events for the youngest athletes, aged 12 to 18. The second day began with a grand procession into the Hippodrome to celebrate the start of the popular equestrian events. The most anticipated and spectacular of these was the Quadriga, a four-horse chariot race. Horse racing events were unique in that the winner was not the most skilled jockey, but the owner of the fastest horse or chariot. The Spartan princess Kaniska once took advantage of this loophole to skirt the rule that women weren't allowed to compete and earned two Olympic victories in the process. The rule also allowed for occasionally strange results, like in 416 BCE, when the statesman Alcibiades entered seven chariots into a race and won first, second, and fourth place. After the equestrian competitions, the 40,000 spectators migrated to the stadium to watch the pentathlon events. When the day's events were over, funeral rites were performed for the hero Pelops, the mythical founder of the Olympic Games. The night ended with a celebratory feast and a great parade in honor of the day's victors. Victory at the Olympic Games was one of the highest honors a mortal could achieve, and there were several ways to immortalize that honor. Some athletes had statues erected of themselves, while others commissioned poets to write them victory odes. Oral tradition was very important to the Greeks. These odes, called epinikia, were often composed by the finest poets in the land, such as Pindar, Simonides, and Bacchylides. They were usually played at banquets and celebrations attended by the triumphant athlete or upon his departure from Olympia. The pentathlon took place at the stadium on the second day. As its name implies, it was made up of five events, discus throwing, javelin throwing, jumping, racing, and wrestling. There are several differences between the ancient version of events and their contemporary counterparts. For example, ancient long jumpers held weights in their hands to give them momentum to launch, since there was no run up before the jump. Similarly, if an athlete won the first three events, they were immediately declared the winner, instead of being judged by their overall performance in all five events. Running events work the same as they do today, with the notable exception of all the athletes being nude. As for wrestling, competitors were not divided by weight class as they are today, but instead by age. The winner was the first to throw his opponent to the ground three times. Day three started with the most important event of the festival. A procession of Helenodikai, ambassadors, competitors, and animals 
made their way to the great altar in front of the Temple of Zeus. The animals were then offered as the official sacrifice of the festival. The afternoon of day three was dedicated to foot racing events. Running was the oldest event of the games, and in fact was the only event at the first Olympics. The main race was called the Stadion, which was a sprint of around 180 meters. The winner was granted the honor of lending his name to the four-year period between the games. This period was known as the Olympiad. The four years that followed the first games in 776 BCE were known as the Olympiad of Coroibus of Elis, the first Olympic champion. Once all the competitions were over, a public banquet was held in the Pretineon to celebrate the day's victors. Day four was mainly for combat events. Wrestling matches were held in the morning, followed by boxing and pancration. Pancration was a no-holds-barred mix between wrestling and boxing. Almost all moves were permitted, except for biting, poking the eyes or mouth, and striking the genitals. The event was very popular, and it was seen as the ultimate expression of strength and technique. Later on in the afternoon, there was a unique racing event called the Hoplitodromos, or race in armor. In this event, competitors wore a helmet and held a shield to simulate running in the battlefield. The Hellenodikai, or judges of the Greeks, were both the game's adjudicators and their organizers. They hailed from Elis, the city in charge of the sanctuary of Olympia, and new judges were elected each Olympiad. They had several responsibilities. Before the game started, they decided which athletes would be allowed to compete and supervise their training. They also drew lots to make the competition brackets. During the games themselves, they picked the winners and kept an eye out for foul play. For the latter, they were assisted by stick and whip-wielding umpires who stood near the athletes and punished them if they were caught cheating. Victory in Olympia was one of the most prestigious honors in all of Greece. Not only would victors be showered in glory in their home city, but their names would be known across Greece. The temptation to glory led some athletes to break their oath to Zeus and cheat. This could be dangerous, as there were many possible punishments should cheaters be caught. They could be disqualified and fined, or if they were caught cheating during a match, they would be beaten by nearby umpires. The most powerful deterrent of cheating, however, was shame. At the foot of Mount Kronios and on the way to the stadium were a group of bronze statues called Zanes, the plural of Zeus. These statues were inscribed with the names of the cheating athletes, how they cheated, and the fine that was imposed. The Zanes, which were funded by cheaters' fines, were strategically placed to be highly visible. Individuals or even entire cities could be found guilty of cheating. The Pretineon was the administrative center of the cult of Olympia and the Olympic Games. The building housed the sanctuary's priests as well as the game's officials. It was also used to stage the grand banquet held on the evening of the third day to honor victors. It also had a sacred function. Its central chamber was the location of the fire of Hestia, a sacred flame that burned day and night. This fire was used to light the other altars around the sanctuary. This practice may have partially inspired the modern tradition of carrying the Olympic torch. Hello again! I hope you enjoyed your visit. With their spectacular events and lavish banquets, the Olympic Games were a feast for the senses. 
I am certain even Zeus himself was entertained by the festivities. Now, is there anything else you'd like to do? Very well. Safe travels, my friend. Welcome to Athens, Wanderer. More specifically, welcome to the musical hub of the city, the Odeon. The Odeon was where musicians came to share their songs with the public. The melodies played here caught the wind and drifted through the air, soothing the souls of Athenians across the city. Come find me when your visit is complete, and we will talk about the things you've learned. See you soon, Wanderer. Music played an important part in almost every aspect of ancient Greek life. Whether attending a public gathering, rubbing elbows at a dinner party, laying out offerings in a temple, or marching into battle, there was a song for everything. Aristotle even wrote that music increased the efficiency of laborers, and it was often played for rowers and field pickers to keep them working at a steady rhythm. Musical contests, or agones, were originally only held during religious festivals. Over time, they became cultural events in their own right and attracted musicians and spectators from all over the Greek world. For example, the Athenian Panathenaea festival featured competitions for instrument playing and poetry recitation. The Dionysia festival included contests between groups of male singers to see who could best perform a dithyram, a merry hymn in honor of the god Dionysus. While these contests could be attended by all, women weren't allowed to compete in them. In the early days of the competitions, winners only received a crown and an ego boost for their talents. But from the Hellenistic period onward, the rewards were upgraded to cash prizes. These prizes were large enough for musicians to make a fortune especially if they moved from festival to festival. The Odeon of Pericles was built sometime between the 440s and 430s BCE. The building was commissioned by Pericles for use in the Panathenaea festival. The Odeon was also a venue for poetry readings, political rallies, and philosophical performances. According to ancient sources, the original design of the Odeon was inspired by the tent of the Persian king Xerxes, a spoil of war the Athenians salvaged after their decisive victory at Salamis in 480 BCE. The building's roof was made of timber from captured Persian ships. In this sense, the Odeon was both a triumphant symbol of Athens and an insult to their Persian enemies. This structure was considered one of the grandest architectural accomplishments of ancient Athens. In ancient Greece, there was a type of music for almost any occasion. Complicated songs like hymns, paeans, and dithyrams were meant for the ears of the gods and as such were usually played during religious ceremonies and civic life. Meanwhile, a hymenaeus was a song performed at weddings, and a threnody accompanied funeral processions. For more merry occasions like symposia, scolia were the soundtrack of choice. However, drama was considered the epitome of artistic expression, since it combined songs with poetry, dance, acting, and costumes. Plays were thought to be the connection between mortals and gods, and the songs that accompanied them 
especially those from the tragedies of Euripides, often became huge hits in the rest of Greece. Hello again. I trust your visit was worthwhile, and that learning of music was a feast for your mind. I know it was for mine. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Farewell, wanderer. I hope you enjoyed the sweet sounds of the Odeon. Welcome to Gnosos, traveler, where the Minotaur once prowled. Gnosos was the seat of the old Minoan civilization, where King Minos once supposedly ruled. These ruins have been the backdrop for many important events in both history and mythology. Look for me when your visit is over, and we'll discuss what you've seen. The island of Crete was first settled around 8,000 BCE. Over time, significant towns and maritime trade began to develop. Palaces were built, destroyed, and then rebuilt, culminating in what archaeologists call the Neopalatial period, which began around 1700 BCE. This period lasted for over 300 years, and is considered the golden age of Minoan civilization. The largest palace of this period was located in Knossos and featured maze-like complexes of workshops, temples, courts, throne rooms, and living areas, as well as paved roads and advanced plumbing and draining. Trade and external relations were important to the Minoans, and their networks extended across the Eastern Mediterranean. As a result, the people of Crete and the lands they traded with often influenced each other and exchanged ideas, usually through peaceful interactions instead of military conflict. The settlement of Knossos was established as early as the 7th millennium BCE. Today, one of the site's most notable landmarks is the Palace Ruins, located on the Kafala Hill. The ruins are split into two phases, the Old Palace, which has been poorly preserved, and the New Palace. The New Palace of Knossos had a surface area of approximately 13,000 square meters, making it the largest Manoan palace. Its focal point was a central court, which was probably used for ceremonial activities. The Minoan palace centers collapsed when Crete was overrun and conquered by a Mycenaean invasion from mainland Greece. However, the date of the final destruction of Knossos's palace is still unknown. During the new palace phase, the ground floor was dedicated to economic activities and contained large storage rooms. The residential quarters, which notably had toilets, were located southeast of the central court at the foot of the grand staircase. The palace was lavishly decorated with wall paintings depicting things like bull-related sports and richly dressed women. Large stone horns of consecration, which were important Minoan religious symbols, hung prominently in the West Court. Other notable parts of the palace include the theatrical area, which is believed to have served as a viewing space, the tripartite shrine, which was dedicated to the worship of an important Minoan deity historians refer to as the Mother Goddess, and the Piano Nobile, a grand space located on the palace's second floor.
During his trips to Crete, archaeologist Arthur John Evans discovered several ancient tablets. They eventually led him to define the forms of Minoan writing known as Linear A and Linear B. The Minoans used these forms of writing for recording many things, including business transactions. For example, one clay tablet discovered at the Palace of Knossos was inscribed in Linear B script. The tablet detailed the transfer of coriander, often used in the perfume industry, between a man named Kyprios and another person named Twynon. The deciphering of tablets such as these has given historians great insight into many aspects of Minoan culture and society. According to myth, the half-man, half-bull Minotaur was born after Queen Pacify slept with a bull sent by the gods as punishment upon her. This embarrassed King Minos, but he could not bring himself to kill the Minotaur. Instead, he hid the monster in a labyrinth constructed by Daedalus. Daedalus was an important figure in Greek mythology, an ingenious inventor. He once became so jealous of his similarly clever nephew that he threw him from the top of the Athenian Acropolis. As a consequence, Daedalus was banished from Athens, though this did not prevent him from being able to get work. In Crete, he was hired by Queen Pacify to construct an artificial cow suit that would allow her to seduce a bull she was particularly taken with due to a curse from the gods. Daedalus complied, and his invention helped facilitate the birth of the Minotaur. Afterwards, Minos conscripted Daedalus to build the labyrinth, presumably as penance for his role in creating the Minotaur. But perhaps the most well-known story about Daedalus involves his son, Icarus, who used wings built by his father and flew too close to the sun, thus plummeting into the sea. Some time after the birth of the Minotaur, King Minos's son Androgeos was killed in Athens by the same bull that impregnated his mother. An infuriated Minos demanded that Athens send seven of their noblest men and seven of their most virtuous women to Knossos every year. After being carried to Crete aboard a ship with black sails, the men and women would then be cast into the labyrinth to be eaten by the Minotaur. One of the Athenian youths chosen to be imprisoned in the labyrinth, Theseus, had enough of the morbid ritual. Before leaving Athens, he proclaimed he would kill the Minotaur, then return to his city on a ship flying white sails. Before entering the labyrinth, Theseus met King Minos's daughter, Ariadne, who fell madly in love with him. Ariadne provided Theseus with a thread he could unravel to help him find his way back out of the maze. Armed with this thread, Theseus entered the labyrinth, killed the Minotaur, escaped the maze, and set sail for Athens with Ariadne by his side. I see you found your way through the maze of ruins. The Minoans played a large part in shaping Greek myths, but also in introducing influences from other places and cultures. Now, what else would you like to do? Farewell, traveler. I hope you enjoyed exploring the ruins. <laughs> Welcome, wanderer, to one of the most prestigious places in Greece, the theater. 
The theater was where audiences gathered to watch plays. They were the highest form of art in Greece, and people saw theater as a symbol of complete harmony between the mortal world and the divine. When you're done taking in the sights and sounds, come see me, and we'll talk more. Until then, Wanderer. Theater is not just part of geek culture, but was a major part of Greek culture. In Athens, comedies and dramas originated from the dancing and singing performed by members of the cult of Dionysus. Between 536 and 533 BCE, theater's burgeoning importance in Athens was demonstrated when the responsibility of organizing tragedies was entrusted to the Archon, the highest ranking magistrate in the city. From then on, theater grew rapidly in popularity, and soon a permanent space for performing and watching plays was built on the slope of the Acropolis. During the 5th century BCE, theater became intertwined with Athens' democracy. It often functioned as an echo chamber for political ideas, and in some cases, it could even influence public opinion. As a result, in the 4th century BCE, Plato coined the term theatrocracy to describe his city's politics. Theatrical competitions were held in the sanctuary of Dionysus Eleutherios, god of wine and patron of drama. Dionysus was the son of Zeus and a mortal woman named Semele. Stories say that Zeus, who had fallen in love with Semele, appeared to her holding a lightning bolt in his hand. Semele was tragically struck dead by the lightning, but Zeus managed to save her unborn child, keeping the embryo in his thigh until it fully gestated. This is why the name Dionysus is sometimes thought to mean born twice. In Athens, theater was a part of the cult of Dionysus and stage productions in the gods' honor were held during festivals like the Linnea and the Great Dionysia. In Athens, there were three festivals that honored Dionysus with drama performances. The Rustic Dionysias, the Linnea, and the Great Dionysia. For the Rustic Dionysia, each demi of Attica organized their own Dionysiac procession. The parades were full of phallic songs, dances, and symbols meant to signify fertility, and participants wore drunkard masks and sang body lyrics about the god. The Linnea was the oldest Dionysian festival. It was exclusively reserved for Greek citizens and mostly made up of comedy performances. Finally, the Great Dionysia was the most important festival. Taking place over several days, it began with a parade called a phallophori, followed by a dithyram contest and ending with consecrated drama competitions. The Great Dionysia was supervised by the head magistrate known as the Archon, who was assisted by 12 other magistrates. Among his duties, the Archon picked Korigoi, rich Athenian citizens responsible for providing the budget for rehearsals and performances. Two days before the Dionysia, a ceremony called the Proagon took place where playwrights introduced their work. The Dionysia finally began in earnest with a procession to the god's temple, followed by sacrifices and a symposium. The next two days centered on dithyram contests, while the final four days were dedicated to drama competitions. The contest's outcomes were decided by ten judges who were appointed at random by the Archon. The judges placed their votes in an urn, and five of the votes were randomly picked to determine the winner. All Athenian stage actors were male, regardless of whether they were playing men or women. Tragedies originally featured only one actor performing alongside a chorus, eventually reaching a maximum of four. Adding more roles opened up the opportunity for dramatic dialogue. During performances, they prepared themselves in the skene, a building that served as a backstage area, before emerging onto the proskenion, or stage. The skene could be painted to represent backdrops like palaces, temples, and tombs. 
Its roof was reserved for appearances by the gods. These gods could be moved around with a crane called a makane, which produced spectacular visual effects. On stage, actors wore masks and elaborate costumes. For tragedies, they were adorned with magnificent clothes. While for comedies, actors playing male characters wore hugely exaggerated phalluses, probably to maximize the laughs. The centerpiece of the theater was the orchestra, or dancing place. It was a large, circular area that hosted choral performances, religious rites, and presumably, acting. Choruses were composed of men wearing masks and costumes. Any Athenian citizen could be choratai, as long as they were selected by the chorus director. Chorus members also served as the equivalent of a curtain, as their entrance and exit marked the beginning and end of the play. New costumes and masks were produced for the chorus for every new play, and they were often just as impressive and elaborate as the performances. For example, Aristophanes' comedies feature the chorus dressing as wasps, frogs, birds, clouds, and islands. One of his plays, The Knights, even had men riding other men dressed as horses. Athens' Theatron, or performance space, could seat up to 17,000 people, nearly a tenth of the population of Attica. Its excellent acoustics made it ideal for drama, but it was also sometimes used for political meetings and parades. The theater was accessible to everybody. This did not mean that seating was free, though. The first rows were normally where priests and public officials sat while the central part of the auditorium was reserved for ambassadors and guests of honor. There is also evidence that men and women sat separately. In general, theater audiences were emotional and noisy. During performances, they would shout, curse, and throw things depending on their mood, and their reactions were just as much a part of the experience as the acting. Hello again, Wanderer. I hope your visit was entertaining. Though all art forms were important in Greek culture, none had the same prestige as theater, which provided a unique experience with every performance. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Then I will leave you be. Farewell, Wanderer. My friend, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Corinth's Temple of Aphrodite. In Greece, many love stories were told about the gods. How romantic! Sometimes they were heartwarming and happy, but they often ended in tears, tragedy, and a whole brood of illegitimate children. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Zeus! Anyway, this tour will introduce you to some of these divine love stories, which may give you perspective on how the Greeks approached love in their own lives. Enjoy your visit, my friend. I'll come see you again when you finish the tour. Much like Athens, Corinth had its own Acropolis, called the Acrocorinth. The natural promontory provided an excellent view of the surrounding territory. It was also the home of several sanctuaries, allegedly constructed in the 6th century BCE. The Acrocorn's most famous attraction was the Temple of Aphrodite. Pisanius describes it as having statues of Aphrodite, her son Eros, and the sun god Helios. According to Strabo, the temple's most distinguishing feature was its servants, who acted as sacred prostitutes. 
However, Strabo is the only source for this information, and it is still hotly debated to this day. Love played a large role in countless mythological stories. Zeus himself was not immune to the feeling, and fell for both mortals and other deities. Some myths centered on forbidden feelings that led to tragedy, such as Phaedra's love for her stepson, Hippolytus. While marriage was prominent in mythology, it was usually presented as problematic. For example, Aphrodite frequently cheated on her husband, Hephaestus, and Medea's resentment against her ex-husband, Jason, eventually drove her mad enough to murder her children. These less-than-ideal depictions reflected the Greeks' idea of marriage, which they viewed as a civic duty instead of a romantic union. The goddess Aphrodite was one of the mightiest Olympians and was typically associated with love, beauty, and sex. She was worshipped all across the ancient Mediterranean by men and women, both young and old. Her origins differ depending on the version of the story. The poet Hesiod says that she was born from the severed genitals of Uranus, while Homer's version of the myth names her as the daughter of Zeus and Dione. Aphrodite appeared regularly in mythological stories and had many mortal lovers. Her favorite was Adonis, a beautiful boy who died tragically in a hunting accident. Aphrodite was devastated by his death, so she created a cult called the Adonia to commemorate him. My friend, good to see you again. I bet you were surprised by some of the stories you heard. For a bunch of immortal beings, the gods certainly were saucy, eh? Tell me if there's anything else I can do for you. Normally, I don't let people go until they buy a souvenir. But for you, my friend, I'll make an exception. 